I'm, I'm proud of Trevor. I'm proud of the work that I've done. I'm proud of the work that other people have put into it to make it what it is. I think it resonates with people. It, it has picked just the right thing. You know, it's not one concept. It, it's adaptable to whatever anybody wants to do. I know people who have just totally abandoned the uh, original travel universe and have their own, and they just have poured their hearts into it. Hi, welcome to the Daiku Podcast. I'm Gary Snow, and joining me today is Mark Miller. It's a great pleasure to have you on, Mark. Uh, and Mark is the creator of the best-selling sci-fi role-playing game of all time, Traveler. The game was so influential that it ended up in the Adventure Gaming Hall of Fame, where Mark is also himself an inductee, only behind Gary Gygax uh, when he was inducted into the Hall of Fame. And um, Mark now runs Far Future Enterprises, who owns and maintains the Traveler brand, as well as the author of Agent of the Imperium, which was published in 2020. Mark, welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I'm interested to see what you're going to talk about. Yeah, I know uh, there is not a, a week that goes by that I don't see some new designer picking apart Traveler as part of uh, an analysis or a thesis of like why the game works so well and the structure that you created. And when you think going back to it, and uh, I think it was 1977 that it was uh, you created it. Okay. A long time ago. Uh, so let's dive back into that time and, and maybe you can tell us how you got started in the gaming in the first place. Oh my goodness. Uh, you know, you, you point out that 1977, so that makes it 2027 is going to be the 50th anniversary of Traveler. And somebody, uh, some of my people have already started sending me little notes. And what are we going to do for the 50th anniversary? And frankly, if we can come up with great stuff, I don't think we'll wait, but it'll be fun. Um, I started in gaming because I was looking for something to do. Frankly, at the time, and that would be the early 70s, Bobby Fischer was big in chess, and I was watching the match matches on TV. And when I ended up down at uh, Illinois State University, I met the people of the game club. Frankly, I went to the chess club. And we all know what chess is like. I don't mean to put chess down, but it is very concentrated on playing chess. And I was looking for more sociability. And I ended up at the Strategic Games Club, which was Frank Chadwick and Rich Banner. And um, with that, I encountered games that I would never have encountered. You know, the Avalon Hill games, the, the SPI games, the board war game hex and counter games. And they taught me how to play. And in the course of them, me working with them and learning how to play, I got into game designing and we started a game company. And it was all hex and counter games. It was uh, um, Drawing That Ghost in the Russian Front, World War II. I did Triplanetary, which is science fiction. Um, I did Chaco, which is the Bolivians versus the Paraguayans in 1932. A, a war that still no one has ever heard about. Um, we joined forces with Lauren Wiseman, and we created the core of a, of a, a I think, a wonderful game company when we had a good time. We, we eat, ate, lived, and breathed games, but they were war games. And this guy, Gary Gygax, uh, 200 miles north of us in Lake Geneva, came up with Dungeons and Dragons. You know, by that time we had a game office, you know, it's upstairs above the drugstore in downtown normal Illinois. And uh, I worked from 10 in the morning till two in the morning, you know, around the clock. We all had a good time. We all worked very hard. And somebody from the Michigan game community visited us because they liked hex and counter games. And by the way, they pulled out their copy of Dungeons and Dragons. And don't remember quite how they started it, but it took our company by storm. And by storm, I mean, somebody took those game, that game away from the guy who brought it, took it downstairs to the copy shop, 
and made five copies on you know crummy Xerox paper so that we would all have copies because we couldn't get a copy. They were hard to get. Um, a week later, Frank Chadwick, the president of Game Designers Workshop, decreed that we were not allowed to play Dungeons and Dragons while the sun was up. <laughs> <laughs> no work was getting done. Literally, no work was getting done. We were trying to design. This was 75, maybe. Um, we were, had games on the schedule. We had things we had to do. We had shipping to do. We had stuff to go out. And nobody was working. They were all playing Dungeons and Dragons all day long. And so it was a good call. No Dungeons and Dragons if the sun's up. And, and there was, you know, malicious compliance, I think, because people would play until 5.30 in the morning and then kind of shift and go to work and be dragging because they played all night. But at least we got some more work done. And at GDW, when at that time, when you guys were playing all night and like working all day, when did you actually start to go, we want to make games like this? Oh, um, Frank, almost immediately. So one of the one of the people we had working for us was Daryl Haney. You know, he was just a, a college student um, who really was a, a really interesting guy. Um, and so he was taking fencing lessons. He took fencing lessons and came by with his little fencing foils and said, "Look what I'm learning at my fencing lessons." And Take us out in the in the alley behind the store the the storefront, and we would clack blades together. And he was no, you have to do it like this. And he was, and that really caught Frank Frank's mind, Frank's attention. Daryl created a a fencing sequence, you know, a, a a logical structure for each person acting or reacting and doing a fencing game. But it was it was the mechanics of fencing, Frank took that and of course he knew what Dungeons and Dragons was. And so he he created a structure that would sit around fencing, uh, an excuse for fencing. So he, it's a Three Musketeers game. It was called On Guard. It's still a little classic and it was classic, I think for a, a couple of really good reasons. One was unlike Dungeons and Dragons, it was a one shot. You played it tonight with your characters and at the end of the, there was no real ending. And at the end of the night, you were done. And the next time you played, you created new characters again. You, you didn't keep your characters. It also, it had something called social standing in it. And, and players, one player clearly had the highest social standing based on the dice. It, any, any player could be the highest guy on the list. And everybody else had to suck up to him because he was the biggest guy. He was the, the, the most influential guy. And you got more social points if you got his attention and he, he deigned to pay attention to you. And so we would have you know, some casual player be the best, the highest social standing. And everybody else really sucked up to him. I thought it was a lot of fun. And so, and it was a new guy every time because it was all based on the dice. They were, I call it genius design concepts. I mean, people, this was a, a, a wild west of game design at the time. You could do anything, try anything out, and people would, would buy it and you would get feedback, not like the internet today, but it was a, a, a fun time. Um, in fact, Gary Gygax saw that game and commented approvingly, mostly because it wasn't a clone of Dungeons and Dragons. No. And Gary, in addition to being an advocate for Dungeons and Dragons, was an advocate for role-playing games in general. He just didn't like people to file the names off and put their own names on a, a variant of Dungeons and Dragons. That was in 75. Um, so then we had that history of playing a game. And sometime in, in late 75, early 76, I said, you know, there are no science fiction role-playing games out there. I want to do one. To which the response was, oh, sure, go ahead. <laughs> so I spent the next year or so um, working mostly nights 
putting together a game sequence, uh, putting together game rules, doing what I thought would be a reasonable way to play uh, a science fiction role playing game, which was an education to me because I thought, never having thought, never, never having thought critically about science fiction, that all the answers were in the science fiction stories I'd read. And I came to discover that nobody really talked about how much fuel you needed to get from here to Alpha Centauri. Nobody really talked about how much fuel was used or how much crew was necessary, um, where it was necessary for the story. They talked about it, but those nuts and bolts were just hidden from us. And I had to make them up, which I did. And, uh, uh, my my mantra, my my thesis that I had is, I thought it had to be understandable to a player who just picked this up and knew nothing about it, and I think that that's what Traveler does. It, it's it's trend, it, it's easy to understand. It's not some strange concept. So I remember one of the game design concepts is how do we capture. How do we have enough energy to jump from here to another star system? And one suggestion was, you know, a, a controlled, contained nuclear explosion inside of a drive. You know, so it had to be very strong. The containment capsule, and you know, you detonated this this twenty kiloton device. It created enough energy instantaneously to be absorbed and used by the jump drives. Um, it created. It made sense. I mean, it's a great concept. It made sense. But if you express it like that, the first thing you get from your players is, I've got an atomic bomb. You know, if I just don't set it up in there, if I have it out here, I can set it off and look what it'll do and make people do what I want. And and those are the concepts of game design that we had to kind of, to deal with. You know, there was uh, an idea that made sense, but its ramifications meant that the game went in a different direction than we wanted it to because we didn't want everybody to go out of space yet to have nuclear weapons as well. Um, those are the design concepts we had to deal with. And I think we dealt with them reasonably well. When you first put together the, and my little beloved uh, black uh, box, when you first put that together, did you know that it was going to be three little black books? Like, did you know how you were going to structure it? Here, here's a secret I'll tell because nobody cares. I had a copy of Dungeons and Dragons over to the right of my typesetting console. <clears throat> and I said, I want to do this science fiction game and I wonder what format I'll use. Well, we have a format. It's a little box, a white box or a wood grain box with three books in it. And so uh, Dungeons and Dragons has characters in combat. I have characters in combat. They have uh, worlds and magic and I had worlds and adventure. They had I don't know what, and I had starships. You know, I, I it, if, if you track the structure of Dungeons and Dragons and the structure of Classic Traveler, they're pretty much the same um, because people were all, already familiar with it. Um, we didn't have a lot of multi-sided dice, so we went to six-sided dice. So we thought it was we thought it was easier and more understandable to use six-sided dice. Um, but my format was I wanted something familiar to the players and they knew how to play Dungeons and Dragons. And so we wanted to show it to them in much the same way. All new words, all new concepts, but the structure, yeah, was Dungeons and Dragons. Of course, they changed it right away. They went to advanced Dungeons and Dragons. They went to all kinds of starter sets and everything else. And, a lot of people didn't see the similarity after that. And for the covers, I, I have to ask the the say the black covers with the red strip um, in like artwork and that kind of stuff. I mean, it's so iconic now. But at the time, like, did you think about how you were going to design them and like the artwork inside and like what process did you go through for that? I won't say it was accidental. I, I I've talked about this before, and you know, and one way of interpreting it is certainly we didn't have any artwork and we didn't know where to get it because we're a game company, not a publisher of any real power. Um, we didn't know how to, we didn't have access to good artists. Um, that took work and 
you know, I have to remember this was was cold. It, it was I call the cold type era, but it was sort of pasting things down on paper and and making separations and giving instructions to printers. Today, you just get a picture on your on your screen and show it to a printer and give them the file and it'll print it. Then you had to kind of make things work with several steps of, of graphic design. And one of them was color pictures were hard to get and they were expensive to print. Um, we weren't printing a lot of color box covers at the time. Um, I was also pretty much doing this game by myself. I mean, it's not like, at the same time, Game Designers Workshop was publishing several other games. I literally published two other games at the same time. One was Raffia, an ancient war game, and the other was Imperium. Um, as a, a wonderful board game, the first one we had done with a mounted board. I was very proud of it. Um, and at the same time, I was doing Traveler. And so when the time comes to say, we're going to have to make this final production step, what are we going to use for art? Well, we had some art, but it really didn't look good. We had some ideas. Maybe we'll print it on, on silver foil paper for to look like metal of a starship. Um, none of that seemed to work. And, and we were up against the wall on it. And, you know, things were designed at that point over a light table. You have you know, fluorescent, fluorescent lights under milk glass and paper on top of it, and it shows through. And Rich Banner, in this moment of, you know, design genius, said, let's try this. You know, he says, we'll make the box black. We're going to put the title in Optima, which is a very sophisticated font. You know, we were deliberately not calling it Space Wars or or space something, space patrol, we picked a name that was totally not a science fiction name. And uh, we picked Traveler, we put double L in it, enough to make it look a little different. And he picked uh, the Optima as the type font. And he said, let's do some words on the front. And of course, words, like radio, you know, get people, get our brains cranking far better than television and illustrations. And so uh, I can still remember that, that day. I don't know the date, but I can remember that day, he and I leaning over the light table and I had gone to the, the well, I had written some text because he'd said, we need text. And I'd written the distress call and he just kind of pushed it around on the table and put it in place and said, and of course it was white with black type. And he was saying, this is going to be red and this is going to be white and the whole thing will be black and it'll be very stark, but we won't put stars on it that will mess it up. And there we are. So, you know, you say iconic and of course we, we beat that icon to death, putting it out there. It was noticeable. It made us look different than every other box on the shelf. And uh, I think that's the genius. I don't know that, I, you know, I don't even think Rich Banner would say, oh, I knew it was going to go like this. You know, he didn't do that. I know that. Um, but he did lay the groundwork for something that could be used iconically. You know, um, you say iconic. Um, you look at Magic the Gathering and their their box, you know, 20 years ago with the Minotaur on it. And uh, that became iconic for Magic. Well, they didn't intend it to be iconic. I know the process was something like, we're putting this box together, we've got all these cards, should I use this Sarah Angel or should I use this Minotaur or a Black Lotus? I'll use the Minotaur. And he used that and he put it in place. And then you print, you know, several thousand copies right away and everybody sees it. And that's the picture, the picture they see. And so that Minotaur became iconic 
it's as much because you use it a lot that it becomes iconic rather than it's just brilliant. Of course, the artist, I think, believes that he drew the best Manitar that ever, ever was. <laughs> and that's why it went iconic. And I'll let him think that. But it's the public sees a lot of it and it becomes iconic. And uh, at the same time, it was a great design. You know, it was a great graphic design. You can only do it once. And we did it. You know, nobody else can do that again. So. And in relation to the zeitgeist of the time, Star Wars came out in 1977. Did um, Traveler come out prior to or in and around it or just after it? How did that kind of play into the game? You know, I was designing Traveler in, through 1976 and the first half of 77. It came out in July of 77. It came, it showed up at our um, offices in a, um, you know, it, I think it went to the printer sometime in early June. And Star Wars came out in June. Today, you would know a movie like that's coming for months before it comes out. Here, there was a review of it in Time magazine that said, Star Wars, this is a great story. This is a great movie. And that's when we heard of it. It's literally when it showed up somewhere in the theater somewhere. And so... Uh, Saw some pictures in the paper, in, in the reviews, but just one or two. What are you going to find? There's no, you know, we're so blessed today by instant communication. But then we didn't have it. I remember that we were done. The game had gone to the printer. Now we kind of had a little lull of time. Lauren Wiseman and I said, let's drive 120 miles to Chicago to one of those theaters and see Star Wars. And we did, and of course, it was a, um, it was Traveler, you know. We were clear, oh, this is great, this is Traveler. But it was a total parallel development because we did not know it was coming until it showed up. Did it provide an uptick, do you think, for the, the game? Uh, did people suddenly go, I wanna play Star Wars in the Traveler uh, rule set? Oh, clearly. It, it, it wasn't so much that people, some people I'm sure played Star Wars with their travel sets, but um, all the, it, I, I won't discount it. I certainly think Star Wars and Traveler came out within a month of each other, and they both shared a common uh, appeal to the marketplace that wanted to see science fiction, whether in gaming or in, in movies. Um, gaming was desperate to have a good science fiction alternative to Dungeons and Dragons. Um, the, certainly the, the market that GDW sold to was less a fantasy and more a, a historical or a science-based um, attitude. So, uh, but I, I certainly won't discount it. Was, it certainly helped us to have Star Wars come out at the same time. As a game company, we produced board games, mostly. We would produce a board game. Um, originally, we put them out in, in Ziploc bags or brown paper envelopes. And then we went to some sort of brown cardboard packaging. And then we went to boxes. And we knew that, uh, you know, accounting and, and game and, and Publishing and uh, business administration tells us that you look at how many you sell of something to see how many you're going to sell of something else. So we could expect we could print two or three thousand of a board game and expect to sell it out in eighteen months and probably reprint it. We, and that was our attitude. We didn't print more than that; it wasn't worth it. But we could always go to a reprint if we sold that many. Distribution was just starting to happen. Uh, as opposed to just direct sales to the marketplace. And so we had a good understanding that we could pr produce two or 3,000 of a game and sell it out in 18 months. We did Traveler. We produced 2,000 of the original book, books box set and sold it out within a month. Went back and reprinted another 2,000. And we, we printed a total of 
10,000 copies in the first year of just the three books set in a box with no support, no adventures, no additional materials, no magazine to support it, no nothing, just sending out a, a mailer to our mailing list and it going to stores. Well, 10,000 versus two or 3,000, that's a huge number. That's a huge um, pent up market demand for what we had. And that just, kind of sat back and watched it for the first year. And at that point we said, we need to support this game. People want more material for it. So we did the easy things first. I say easy, but they were also in demand. You know, a thousand and one characters and animal encounters and all those things. But this, and, it, and we got to go back to the game rules and say, well, these rules could be more clear. These rules could, be expanded upon. And we tried doing that. And that's the first sets of, of things that we produced were things that people wanted that were helpful to them. And of course, we had to start doing adventures, big spaceships and all that. Yeah. Well, I know that uh, some people really appreciated the fact that uh, the design was so open to the creation of your own worlds, your own sectors, and that kind of thing, that it left room for some creative decisions. But you and you kind of alluded to the fact that there was a real demand for adventures and that kind of thing. But if we take a step back to even the rules themselves, the character creation process, and time and time again, people have talked about how ingenious it was for you to do the life path. And that was the first um, time that anybody had ever seen that in a game. I mean, it was, you know, early days. Can you tell us how that concept came to be in your head? Um, so we had a game, it was called Imperium and it's not the Imperium that we published, but it was a different game and it was a, um, a strategic um, space exploration game. And it was a, a game map of a hex sheet, hex encounter game it was, uh, everybody starts from earth and we're gonna go start exploring. Um, have some other, we had alien races in it. We had uh, a variety of alien races. We had mercenaries, we had, but it was star systems, many hexes between them with slower than light exploration. Uh, at one point it was called Wagon Train to the Stars. You would launch a ship and it would make its way towards that star. You launch another one and it would follow because you couldn't wait until it got there. Um, and it was economic, you would build things. And it was a really tedious bookkeeping accounting game of space colonization. Um, and I'm glad we never published it because it would not have been exciting. It would not have been fun. Um, but even acknowledging that we needed to do something. And so this was probably pre-Dungeons and Dragons in that sense, because um, I said, we need to make this more interesting. And so I'm going to give you know, each of you players is the head of the government, the head of government of Earth or of Alpha Centauri or of some other thing. Each of you is the head and you're making vast strategic decisions. I'm going to give you a son, pre-equal rights amendment. I'm going to give you a son. And he can be, you can make him be a general or an admiral or a, a a brilliant explorer or a scientist. Um, and he is going to give you plus one on the die roll wherever he is. And it's valuable. He's, he's your son. He's, he's your representative. He goes out and does things and he helps things happen. He, he is a strong influence to success. But if he's killed, He's dead, and you don't get another one. You're not going to get another son to come up to the. And it, it, it really had a, a, an interesting effect on the players because they would have this person 
who was a, a valuable resource, but they would tend to not put them in danger's way. They would tend to um, not waste that sun on frivolous things. And it, it was kind of an experience to me to see how we could make this whole process more personal. Um, but as I say, that game system didn't go anywhere. So then we created um, character generation. And I remember being aware that if people, I, I wanted to do a life path. I was aware, I, I, I felt that you start with an 18 year old character, a, a, a recruited, a, a just a guy like a, a, a level one d d character in a scientific, in, in a science-based society, he has no power. He can't do anything. He's just going to be a, a low-level apprentice on the drive, in the drive chamber of the ship. He's not going to be the captain. He has no chance of doing anything. So we have to have a career path so that we can move these people forward. And it was not um, it was also clear to me that everybody would want to be an admiral and we can't have a bunch of admirals. So I added this, your character can die. There's a survival role in this, this path. And I, I typed up a little, that little page of, of the sequence of enlist and promotion and commission and survival and then continue. Um, and I, we had a typesetting machine. It was a huge IBM monster, you know, electric typewriter thing that, that would typewrite, would typeset. And so I printed the page out. It was literally, you know, a, that size page. And I handed it to people and said, let's test this out. And they all generated their characters. And the first guy came along and died. And we all howled at <laughs> how greedy he was trying to become an admiral. He couldn't get past, you know, um, a, Marie, uh, a Navy lieutenant because he really did not analyze his characteristics well enough. So, but I thought we had something when that happened because it was fun. And uh, I don't, I, we all wanted this game to be fun as well as interesting and compelling. And, and that thing was fun. And everybody enjoyed having their character die. And literally, this was before they started adventuring, before we had, had, had tested the combat system out. This is early in the book. We typed it in order. And it was just a lot of fun. Well, and you see that so influential nowadays. Um, like I've had um, uh, a lot of creators talk about how that the background of the characters are so influential in adding flavor to the actual game and how it just jumpstarts people right into playing that they they have all this background that they can start to work with um yeah. and i you know obviously you have been widely credited for that um within the industry and then the other um thing that you've been credited widely for is the skill sets that up until then, I don't think there was skills anywhere in any role-playing game, and you implemented them as part of the characters. Um, thanks for asking about that. Let me go back for a minute. It just comes to mind that in the design of the character system, um, the other thing is the, the continue role. You know, can I continue? I graduated from the University of Illinois with a degree in sociology and a commission as a second lieutenant. And I was going to be an Army career officer. I was going to spend 20, 25 years in the Army and, and then retire. And so I learned my craft of a sociology degree is perfect for becoming an air defense officer to shoot down airplanes. Um, and, of course, that's a great skill set to take to Vietnam, where <laughs> they have no use for that. So they made me a motor, motor pool officer instead. Um, and then when I came back, I um, this all influenced character generation. You realize, you know, I came back. I literally was had been to Vietnam for a year, come back, and everybody, all of my classmates in the army, had not gone to Vietnam, and so I 
met them again, and they all had one little ribbon on their their uniform that said that they were in the army. That's what that ribbon was for. Um, and I came back and I had five. I had you know um, a ribbon that says I was in the army, and another one that says I was in Vietnam, and another one says that Vietnam, Vietnam appreciated me for being in, in Vietnam, and then one that said that an army commendation medal that said that I'd done a good job and not screwed up and a bronze star, which is the equivalent of telling an officer that you've done a good job and not screwed up. And I had all this, this salad on my, on my uniform and I looked a lot better than they did. And everybody thought I was a much better officer than those guys were because clearly I had more recognition for it. Yeah. Um, and then the army told me, we don't need you anymore. <laughs> when my time was up, you can't keep in the army, go away. And I just thought, yeah, I'm going to include that in character <laughs> generation as well. <laughs> well, it's funny how your life experiences and your own history have influenced your design principles or just ideas that, that you implemented in the game. Yeah, no, and it, it is. I learned from life and I just used it and I, I literally was using it. I mean, this is how I think it works. Um, uh, the other, uh, another thing that I did, we'll get to skills in a minute, but one of the things is that clearly you can't just stay in the tip, tip top physical condition. And so you start, you hit a point where you're 35 or so. And if you remember that at this point I was 30, you know, 1977, I was born in 47. I was about 30 years old. I'd spent a whole term, four years, working for Game Designers Workshop, designing games, you know. Um, but I had to do an aging system. So I thought 30, 35 is when you start feeling it. And then mental issues at 65. Um, and it wasn't a lot. It was just you would maybe lose a point here or there. And here I am, you know, 30, 40 years later, and that was such an accurate way of how <laughs> aging works. <laughs> it just maybe, maybe you can exercise a lot and keep from losing that point this time, but it keeps coming at you and eventually it's gonna get you. And so I'm, I think I'm better than most in terms of where I am on my aging sequence, but it's still getting to us. Well, I think it's really good. Um, and, you know, when you see movies or books and you see the the spread of ages, like, you know, obviously in most movies nowadays, you've got your 20 year olds that are kind of like the hub of it. But you have yeah. your wise veterans and and young upstarts that are kind of still immature and like but faster and stronger and all those types of things. So you were really able to create probably what it represents a lot of the fiction that we consume as far as that nice spread and, you know, in, in Dungeons and Dragons, I think everybody kind of just goes, well, I'm just, you know, accounting for elf ages and stuff like that, but you're like in your twenties or that everybody's at that same point. And rarely do you get forced into an older age, but your uh, life path system actually creates a nice fictional um, setting and like some interaction between those. It does. And I think that, you know, behind the scenes, role playing is a great hobby for kids because it lets them, it let us do all kinds of things that you can't do otherwise. Uh, there's a great Highland quote, which I, I'm going to mangle, I'm sure, but you know, he says, you know, every man should be able to, you know, plan an invasion, fix a tire. Um, a bunch of things and budget and traveler in specific role playing in general provides that opportunity for kids to do all those things, to try out and fail, you know, to realize that his, his numbers, he, he can, he can make a budget and he can realize he forgot something. But that's a, a great practice for doing it in real life. My, um, at the time, eight-year-old grandson was playing travel with me, you know, and he would, he went off and generated his own character. And I don't quite know what rules he did because it was a Varger character named Coots. And uh, 
he had a billion credits. I don't know where he got a billion <laughs> credits, but you know, I wasn't going to ask. And so we're playing, and I said, "Okay, so you get lunch, and it costs you twenty-two credits." And he laboriously put twenty-two under the billion <laughs> and subtracted, <laughs> and now he had nine hundred ninety-nine million and so forth credits, but took account what it cost him to buy his lunch. And, and it's just an empowerment that he had money and he knew he had to track it and he did, and he did a good job at it. I mean, I think it's daunting to subtract 22 from a billion. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. My math um, skills aren't there yet. Yeah. So you asked about skills. Yeah. You know, skills was another way of um, dealing with what people could do. Um, you know, we're fortunate. We have science fiction in front of us. We have all these stories. We know that people, you write about a character and they, it's not mentioned specifically, but if you read a story, you can probably evaluate that story and say, this guy has these skills. He's, he's an accountant. He's got a math skill. He's got, you know, he gets in a gunfight. He's got a gun. Well, he's probably got a gun skill. Um, there are all those things that are fun, important, and tell us what this guy can do. He can't just do anything. And as soon as you start adding science to the mix, you need skills. Of course, I would argue that if you're doing the, if you're doing Dungeons and Dragons, you need skills. You know, does this guy can can he ride a horse? Could everybody ride a horse? Can he? Uh, uh, how good are you at, at, at non-combat situations? Which we come to, that brings us to a, um, a criticism. You know, all these systems tend to emphasize combat. They come from a war game or a miniatures war game background, and it's about resolving conflict with violence. Um, and if not, there's a lot of, effort put into telling the difference between a long sword and a short sword, and not a lot of effort between telling a difference between insult and flattery, or whatever else you do, that there are so many things that could, if I had it to go do over and go back and redo that when I, when I started, I would have included more on conflict resolution uh, for characters and how to do that instead. It's there, but you have to dig to do it. And that kind of brings up an interesting kind of game design philosophy of, uh, and I'm not too sure if you've been paying attention to some of the, you know, OSR space or uh, FKR space, you know, all these acronyms, but it, it's trying to analyze the difference between um, like, old school gaming philosophies like you would see in ODD and, and Traveler versus some of the newer ones. And the idea behind it being that, you know, uh, rulings over rules that, you know, there's a lot of gray area for those kind of social interactions to take place. And you are melded with your character just because your character is unintelligent. But if you're an intelligent player, you can use that to your advantage. And those social interactions are kind of piecemeal of that as far as how you play the game and the play style that traveler evokes is kind of due to that um fact that you you leave a lot of space for people to to in, insert themselves compared to other games um i won't say compared to other games i you know i like the system it's a simple system i've lived with it much of my life now and i think it works well um, I think there's a difference between the player and the character, but I, I, I sit at the table when I do, there are some people who play themselves regardless of what they have. Um, I think the brilliance of role playing in general, you know, let's just discuss a mechanism that you check your characteristic. We have strength, we have dexterity, endurance, intelligence, education, and social standing. And they're all two dice. 12 high and two low. And so you roll high for the characteristic and then you roll that number or less to do something, you know. Um, you can't live up, you know, 
you can't lift a mountain, but lifting some reasonable thing with the strength of seven, you have to roll seven or less. If you have a 12, you can roll, you're going to do it. So now it's the referee's job to just make sure you don't try and pick up a car as opposed to a heavy object. But the brilliance of that system is a I don't want to be insulting to players, a dumb player, you know, a, a dull player, someone who is not very smart, who, and I, I think, I want to be careful I'm not insulting people, but somebody who doesn't get the puzzle as quickly as someone else um, doesn't have to because the 12 intelligence tells the referee he got it. And so it's just, okay, there's a, 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 a secret lock you have to figure out how to pick. He doesn't have to understand the puzzle because the numbers tell us he understands it. And similarly, you can have a very brilliant player and he's got an intelligence of three and he keeps, although he says, oh, come on, I know that answer. Yeah, you know it, but your character doesn't. And he's not going to. I mean, you're going to have to roll all day to get that answer. And then he has to play that role and do work around it. Now, there's where his intelligence comes in because he says, okay, I'm going to wander around until he comes to something that requires his great strength. And then he's okay. So um, I, I believe in both systems. I believe that players should be allowed to play their themselves as the character. Um, and do what they want. But I also think there are players who are excellent role players who enjoy the challenge of being somebody that they aren't. And you were just talking about all the different stats and uh, one of the innovations, and I was gonna ask you, cause you know, I was, um, I was born in 72, the UPP, um, the universal persona profile and the number system, was there any kind of, system like that in place, like in general, like SKUs or ISBN numbers and that kind of stuff? Or did you actually invent that kind of way to have all the stats like on one line? Oh, I did that. I invented it. Here, here's, here's where it came from. I was reading Lensman at the time. And um, they have, there's a starship, um, one of their warships called the Mauler. And it has a number, a, a designation, a Z9M9Z. I remember that for some reason. And it, it, it told us the characteristics. I don't know what they were, but it, it was a, a standardized way of referring to ships. And uh, the Z, of course, was really big, and the 9 was big and all that. But it was a way of describing that ship. And I, I don't recall how well it was actually decoded to us. but. It was a standardized system. So I wanted to adopt that. I also wanted to be able to list characteristics on a page in um, where the columns lined up, you know, where strength was always in this column. And if you do a 10, of course, you mess it up because it's two digits instead of one. So I went to this hex system because I wanted to be able to show in one place. And, some people don't like it. They don't like to make the decoding. They they want to write their character out as a, an 11, 5, 7, whatever. And that's fine. They can do that. But I find it easier if you're a referee, if you can put all those characteristics in a row. And I always know that that characteristic there is strength or that is intelligence. Well, I think it's a like a, a pretty smart uh, way to like condense a lot of the information. Um, the other things I actually wanted to talk to you today about was like the sector building and the starship building and how um, I recently had uh, Deborah from uh, Geek Gamers on and she has just released a book on solo GMing and game playing. And so she, in that space, uh, she talks about how, you know, even just reading a book is almost the act of solo playing and your books on building starships and sectors and characters are all like mini games within the traveler um, game set or the rule set. And did, did you know that going into it, that people could 
take such great joy out of just sitting down and doing it by themselves? Was that part of the plan or is it just kind of a happy circumstance as much like the character creation process? Um, I'll come at it from a different angle. I, I have trouble settling on one answer to things, you know, and so I could have designed five starships. In fact, I did buy, design five or six starships for the book. Um, but I didn't feel like that gave people enough. And I thought, I could just make up a starship. But then next time I want to design a starship, I don't quite remember what I put into that design sequence. I wanted to do a sequence for myself so that I always knew that this would make you have this much jump and this would have you this speed and this would have you this characteristic and you have to give each each person on the ship needs this much life support. And so I did that. And if you do that, then you can start building a bunch of different ships. Um, but players like to do their own. I like to do my own. We like to draw maps. We like to draw star maps. And I'm following a guy on Twitter who is populating a sector somewhere. And, and he keeps posting. I posted some more worlds on this sector. And he's just making, he's rolling up the worlds and coming to conclusions. You know, one of the criticisms I have, one of the criticisms I get is, oh, that world generation doesn't make sense. You know, I generated a world and it doesn't make sense. Well, first of all, uh, you know, this, the sequence that I do to somebody who, who talks about the world generation system, and I'm just focusing on that for the moment. I say, you know, they say, I've got, I've got an imagination. I can make up worlds myself. And I say, okay, make one up. And they say, okay, an airless world, you know, good. Do another one. Okay, uh, 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 a desert planet with a dead ancient civilization. Okay, good. Do another one. And they do a, um, a swamp world with dinosaurs. Okay, do another one. Okay, uh, uh, a twilight world, you know, half hot, half cold with a twilight zone. Good, do another one. And about then they start, they can't think of another one offhand. And my system says, here's a world with 20% water and whatever. Do another one. Here's another world with 20% water. Who person, is, what man in his right mind would say two worlds in a row would have 20% water? But the dice tell us. That. Um, the dice tell us here's a, um, a high population world with low technology and no atmosphere. How can that possibly happen? Well, there are dozens of reasons why that could happen. Um, there are plenty of stories about that. That system can generate a million worlds and it doesn't need imagination. You just have the need to have the imagination to figure that out. And you can make up all kinds of reasons why, and each of them is equally valid. It's, I, I don't mean to be short with players, but when they can't see that there's something, they're too caught up in trying to make things fit, not stories, but some sort of um, preconceived idea of what worlds would be like out there. And we want to be challenged by those statistics to have a good time. You know, a world with, and I just, I just mentioned that world, a world with um, high population, no atmosphere, you know, and low technology just blossoms for the imagination. It just challenges us. It's a great adventure. You land there and you want, oh, is my ship safe? Are they going to try and steal it? Do they even know who I am? All those things. It's a great idea for a story. And that was the purpose of the generation system is to make people, give people things that they, that where their own imagination fails, that we spend our imagination you know, if one person could imagine everything, then, you know, they could write their own novels and be intrigued by them. But there are thousands of people out there writing novels or movies every day, and there are things that I would never have thought of. And that's what the dice are doing for us here to make it easier. Um, I did not understand how much the systems would 
become mini games of their own. But it, they are what enable people to play Traveler without somebody else there. So I, in one sense, there is a large contingent of the Traveler population are introverts who sit home and do this stuff themselves. They read them and enjoy them themselves. Then that's solo gaming. And we don't, we never had a, a specific solitaire process, but the whole game is conduct, conducive to solitaire play. Were you surprised when uh, people started reaching out going, well, I want adventures, I want meta plots or like worlds rather than the building the sectors themselves? Um, my original thought was um, Traveler would be, GURPS hadn't come along. It would be GURPS. It would be a universal science fiction system to do anything for anybody. Pick up any space novel, any science fiction story, and you could map it to the Traveler system. Um, that's too ambitious a goal. Even GURPS, of course, publishes book after book after book, adapting GURPS to specific situations. Um, there was an early review of Traveler where the player said, I need adventures. I want somebody, I want GDW. That's the failing of this rule set, that it does not provide me adventures to play. And the editor inserted in the middle of this review, and I won't buy a game that does that because I want to be free to do myself. Well, it doesn't hurt you if I produce adventures for this because you don't have to buy them. You can play the basic set and don't worry about it. But there was a pent up demand for more material. And as we, when, if you have a Navy, you have to have an empire that owns the Navy and tells it what to do. If you have an empire, you have to have a government system. So you have to have functionaries and bureaucrats. And how is it elected? Does that work across hundreds of light years? I guess they must be hereditary rulers. Okay, we're gonna have nobles. Um, and it is the logical extension of that. You know. The other thing I had in my mind is I wanted this to be transparent to the user. I wanted it to be intelligible. Um, people ask, you know, how does the empire work? And I, I point out that it's, it, it, you can map it to the United States. There are high tech cities. There are barren territories and deserts. There are low tech cities. I mean, little towns with low population are totally dependent upon the highway system for everything they get. Um, there are high tech cities. There are lawless areas. There are places that you and I don't dare go without a group with us and some confidence that we that would make us safe. Um, and that maps directly to the empire. That maps to all these different worlds of high tech and low tech and, and um, high law level and low law level, um, population, all those things, they map to it. You can also do, um, you know, they say, how can, how can I have a, a, a starport on this low tech world? And I say, okay, let's map it to the Earth. Um, and pick a, you know, Rwanda has a very low tech level and a very low economic level. And nevertheless, it has an international airport and jets can fly in and be refueled and serviced and fly out again. So it seems to me, if we can do that with Rwanda, we can do it with a low tech world with no local abilities to support the starport, but you could have a starport. Um, I keep trying to justify what they are, but I'm trying to teach as well that if you if you look around you, you can see examples. I mean, literally, uh, you know, the entire world depends on jet engines, but they're only manufactured in about 
five places in the world. So, yeah. The, um, the, the worlds that have been built, uh, I, you mentioned the board game Imperium. Is the, how much of that ended up into your uh, your setting, your your baked in setting? Um, the Imperium was literally designed in parallel with Traveler at the same time. I mean, literally, we were producing both board game both games at the same time. Um, but Traveler curiously has never had the tra or Imperium has never had the Traveler name put on it. You know, it was always an independent game. It was set in a different era. Um, we never felt the need to slap the traveler name on it. People kind of knew that anyway. Um, we wanted, we made, you know, the, the foundations of the, of the Imperium, of, the, of the, the, the empire that is the background for the traveler system. You know, we wanted it to not have Earth in it. We wanted it to be somewhere else. We wanted it to be uh, not an Earth empire. Um, but as we tried to explain how that happened, then we had to build circumstances that made people forget that everybody came from Earth. We had to, you know, I just wanted a bunch of human races out there. Um, for a long time, travel was not, didn't have aliens in it. Uh, one of our people, John Harshman, was insistent on scientific accuracy. You know, sometimes I didn't pay attention because it got in the way of play. But he said, you can't have hundreds of human races out there, all human, and they didn't come from the same place. You know, that is impossible. And he convinced us, so we had to come up with some reason why humans all came from Earth, and then we all, that, that idea was lost in, in the clouds of history and prehistory. So I, we did that and it, it helped shape what the system was. I mentioned John Harshman. He was the one who said, instead of having a monster table of here you made a monster or a alien beast, let's, let's do an encounter table based on ecolo ecological niche, niche, niches. You know, that you have grazers and you have herbivores and you have carnivores and you have the, the food pyramid, the, the, the hierarchy of, of carnivores and omnivores and herbivores, um, which helped set us aside, set us, established that we were different because we tried. It certainly was a, a very basic scientific approach to having animals that you encounter, as opposed to just. Oh, you met a big monster and he jumped at you. Um, I know we're <laughs> there's so much detail that we've been covering, and I we probably only got through half of the things, and so I I don't want to keep you too long. But the, the one other thing I really wanted to talk to you about was um, just the way you structured even the campaigns within the setting of uh, first of all the Journal of Travel Travelers Aid Society, which I thought was kind of a nice um, way to encourage people to travel and then the second thing is just the setting or even the the procedural piece of having patrons and and the whole idea of like you know smugglers and basically patrons going we need you to take this from here to there and that kind of structure within the game itself and how did you kind of happen upon that was that like did you sit down and go i need the structure to actually make gameplay happen well, first of all, I want to say that somewhere in there, I got a very angry call from the executive director of the Travel Aid Society <laughs> about this stupid magazine we were putting out, reporting to be their journal. <laughs> and I, and he was very, for people that don't know, like there is a Travelers Aid Society. I don't think it's as relevant today as it was uh, at one point, but it no, really... No was a, a big organization and I can see it, that's where you got the idea for it. It was exactly, you know, it, it, it was on the decline, but this guy, he would call me up and rude and said all kinds of terrible things to me. <laughs> and I just, you know, kind of had to just nod my head and hang up because he just did not get it. <laughs> um, uh, 
the adventures that we did, we were always experimenting with how do we get people to play and how do we give people models on how to play. And so um, if you look at the Dungeons and Dragons adventures, they're the first set of them. They were all the same. I mean, here, you know, Adventure to the Barrier Peaks or the Spider Women's Revenge or whatever they were. It's all, you go somewhere and then you, there's somebody there and there's an underground maze and you go in and you know, kill monsters and then get to the end and fight the big fight and get out with a bunch of loot. Um, we wanted to experiment in our adventures with different formats and different ideas. So you have basically the first adventure was the canoe near, which is a dungeon crawl, you know, in a, in a starship. But we kind of showed people what a starship would look like and how they could draw their own and, and have an adventure like that. And the next one was not a starship, but some sort of an installation, a research station, and a different reason and a different sort of place to go to. Um, and then Twilight's Peak, it, you know, people like maps and things to crawl through, that's fine. But we tried to create a story um, and a puzzle for people to puzzle out. Um, our adventures tended to try and, and tell new ways of doing things. We had um, a supplement with 76 patrons, which the assignment it was done by Lauren Wiseman. And his assignment was find a way of telling people a situation and the ways they can handle it. And so, you know, there's no one answer to handling it. There's no one answer to the, to the puzzle. And so he did, I think he did a wonderful job on it. He created, he created that process, which was an entirely way of, new way of describing adventures. You know, I, I played Dungeons and Dragons a long time ago, and I can't say that I'm up to date on what they do now, but that approach is what early Dungeons and Dragons should have done because they, they should have given people more, more tools on how to play the game and more tools on how to play different aspects of the game. Um, and I think that was a, a, a failure of imagination. But and I, don't want, I don't want to be too superior. They sell a lot more than I do. So maybe they had the right way and I didn't. But, but I, I've always believed in giving the players tools to play many different things, many different ways. And some of them they will like. And the ones that they don't like, they don't have to use. And, and so over the years, uh, and uh, like at a very high level, like uh, you've licensed out Traveler to different uh, publishing companies, um, people created different supplements and adventures for it. And uh, have you been surprised at the, the staying power of Traveler over all these years and all the different iterations and uh, how people still gravitate even to the classic Traveler to this day, like I said, I cannot go a week without somebody picking apart your design going, this is genius. Well, I appreciate hearing that. Um, I, I, I certainly was in the right place at the right time. Um, there was nothing of any real power at the time. And there were two of them there, Starkering, which was a humorous approach. Um, and there was Space Opera. Oh, no, that came later. Uh, Metamorphosis Alpha. Um, but they had different approaches. They were not the broad spectrum, serious approach to science fiction. Um, I'm surprised. I, I'm, I'm not saying I'm, I'm proud of Traveler. I'm proud of the work that I've done. I'm proud of the work that other people have put into it to make it what it is. I think it resonates with people. It, it has picked just the right thing. You know, it's not one concept. It, it's adaptable to whatever anybody wants to do. I know people who have just totally abandoned the uh, original Traveler universe and 
have their own and they just have poured their hearts into it. Um, and it's a far better enterprise than so many other things. I mean, I suppose if you had a lot of money, you could collect Corvettes, <laughs> but uh, I'm not sure that that is more satisfying than creating a, an empire in, in traveling. And one last question before I leave, and I would also just say this now, I would love to have you back as a guest to just talk about maybe the future of Traveler and the fifth edition and that kind of thing. But one last question I have before we leave today is the SRD and how did that come to be? And uh, um, have you have you been paying attention to all the different iterations of the SRD in use? Um, I, I haven't paid attention to all of the iterations. I know some of them. Um, you know, I just said, some people discarded the original Traveler Universe and want to do their own. And the SRD is a, has been a great tool for them to do that um, and enjoy the process and create a following of people who also enjoy that particular imagination. I, I have to agree that, that my vision for Traveler, I want everybody to to, to hew the line and just do that. And I'll tell them, you can't do that, that's wrong. But I don't do that, I don't wanna do that. I mean, Traveler, my original concept was something for everybody. The SRD is just another aspect of that because it lets them do whatever they want. Um, let's end with the one last thing that I think the news makes us have to bring up. Um, Traveler, the original edition, has a little paragraph at the end of character generation that says you can be anybody you want, any sex, any race. It, it, perhaps in today's light, inelegantly expressed, but it has always been you can be anybody you want, and it goes deeper than just Army and Navy and Scouts. It is gender and gender preference. It is um, um, biological heritage. You can be anybody you want. And the, the only discrimination we face is high characteristics are better than low characteristics. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we, we violate that the whole idea completely because we have the bad guys that nobody likes and we have bad words that we use to call Jodani's Joes and it's pejorative. You should really read my novel. You've read it, I know, but you should read my novel, Agent of the Imperium, I can tell all of those out there because it provides another view of this Imperium, so. Well, I will make sure that all those links uh, to uh, the website and where they can buy the novel um, are all in the show notes in the video description. And I just want to say, you know, Mark, uh, I welcome you back anytime uh, you want. And I just want to say thank you for joining us today and, and sharing a little bit of the history and your wisdom in uh, game design. I appreciate talking to you today. Thank you for having me.